welcome back. In this video we're going to piggyback on the hard work we did in the previous video on cosets and take advantage of that to state what's called Lagrange's theorem. Now this is the one that says that the order of a subgroup must divide the order of a finite group in general. And we kind of saw this through our through noticing that cosets partition groups into equal size pieces. And if the subgroup was of a size that didn't divide the order of the group, and there's no way you could actually do this. So really our discussion of sub of cosets has built the, um, the platform we need to prove this thing, and it's going to turn out to be quite an easy one to actually prove. So let's dive straight in and state the theorem and then see how we go from there. So here it is stated uh, formally. So if G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G, then the order of H divides the order of G. And then we've got a second statement about the number of cosets we have. The number of distinct left cosets of H and G is just the order of G divided by the order of H. Okay, so we can use our coset knowledge to go ahead and prove this thing. So our proof is simply a matter of putting together our knowledge about cosets in a sort of coherent way. So let's set up the distinct cosets first off. So let A1H through to ARH be our distinct left cosets. of H. Okay, so let's now demonstrate that every member of a group is in one of these cosets. So I will say for each A and G, A is a member of AH, but each of these cosets, AH, is going to be one of those distinct ones, equals AIH for some I. Okay, so every member of the group therefore belongs to one of the cosets. All right, so that's cool. Um, we kind of knew that already because the way we defined these cosets was we built them by just taking an element and multiplying it by H. So that's cool. We've now established that every member of the group fits in one of the cosets. So G is therefore the union of all of those cosets. And we know the union is disjoint. That was one of our coset properties. What that means is that the order of the group is therefore the sum of all of those orders. A1H plus A2, order of A2H plus the order of ARH, which is R times the order of H because, as we discussed with our coset properties, the order of any one of the cosets is just equal to the order of the subgroup. Okay, so hence, we now have that the order of G is equal to R times the order of H. So this actually is what we wanted. Hence, the order of H divides the order of G. And there are R, which is the order of G divided by order of H, distinct left cosets. Of H. Okay, that's cool. So now we have made a definitive statement saying that no matter what finite group we have, any subgroup of it has to have an order that divides the order of the group. So something we'd sort of been mentioning and passing as we've gone through, and we've noticed it with all our examples, that every time we took a subgroup, its size was always one of the, um, it was always a factor of the order of the group, but we'd only actually proven it for cyclic groups. Um, now we know it's true in general, and we used our scaffolding of cosets to actually build the result. So this theorem is great, and it also comes with some really interesting corollaries to go with it. 
So before we state the first of these, we'll just um, provide a little quick definition. The index, the number of these cosets has a name and it's called the index. So the index of a subgroup H and G is the number of distinct left cosets of H and G and we write it as the absolute value of G colon H. So whenever you see this notation, G colon H with the absolute values around it, just think that's the number of cosets and it's got a name, the index. Okay, so our first corollary to Lagrange's theorem just uh, basically takes the index um, when g is finite, then basically the index just becomes what was stated in Lagrange's theorem. So we just restated it as a statement about the index. So the index works for groups that are not finite also, but when the group is finite, then Lagrange's theorem applies and the index of h and g is just the order of g divided by the order of h. Okay, not, not a huge amount to say there, it's just restating it in slightly different language. Second corollary uh, is very closely related again, it says that the order of an element A in our group divides the order of the group. That's because we know that the order of A is the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A, and we know that cyclic subgroups um, are, are, are subgroups, and therefore by Lagrange's theorem, the order of those divides the order of the group. So the order of any element of the group divides the order of the group. Again, follows pretty directly, but we're just stating it in terms of the order of an element this time. Next one, maybe not so obvious. Um, this says that groups of prime order are automatically cyclic. How does that work? Well, we'll prove it. Well, suppose G has prime order. So what I'll do is I'll choose A to be an element of G that's not that entity. Then the order of A, or the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A, must divide G. Okay, but that cyclic subgroup cannot have order 1, okay, because it's not just that entity. Therefore, that cyclic subgroup must have order that divides G. G has prime order. Therefore, the only possible divide, the only possible size that this um, cyclic subgroup could have is actually P, which is the order of G. Hence, the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by A must equal the order of G, and therefore. G is in fact equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by that element. Okay, that uh, which means in particular that G is cyclic. So that's interesting. As soon as we have a finite group that with prime order, it's automatically a cyclic group, and that's all there is to it. So there is only one type of group you can have of prime order. There is no we know exactly what it will be, it will be a cyclic group, no matter what guise it takes, whether it looks like a, a U group or whatever, um, it's going to be automatically a cyclic group. The next corollary says that A to the order of the group, let's just make that more clearly a G, is the identity. Now that we know that the order of an element divides the order of a group, we know that A, the order of A, The order of A divides the order of the group, so the order of the group is equal to K times the order of A. So, A to the order of the group is equal to A to the order of A to the K, which is the identity as required. All right, we have one more corollary to state, and this one is probably the least obvious of all, but it's really interesting. So our final corollary is actually Fermat's little theorem, which is a theorem from number theory. This says that for every integer a and every prime p, a to the p mod p is equal to a mod p. So you don't actually need to calculate the prime power of a. If you want to know what a to the p mod p is, you can just take a mod p, and that will be the same thing. Okay, so this one looks the least related to Lagrange's theorem of all of them, so we need to actually do some groundwork to actually find a group to make sense of this. Because at the moment we don't even have a group written down here, and so it's a little bit hard to see how it applies. So first off, um, we will take our A and divide it by P and look at the remainder. Okay, so we know... 
I will choose R such that A is equal to PM plus R where 0 is less than equal to R is less than P by the division algorithm. So when we're using modular arithmetic mod P, it pays to divide by P first and take the remainder and work with that as it's always, almost always going to um, work better. So hence, why do we do that? Well, we can write that in terms of modular arithmetic as A mod P equals R. Okay, so this is going to save us some work. Therefore, we need to prove R to the P mod P is equal to R. Okay, equivalence, equivalent statement, we just divided by P first to make our modular arithmetic easier and take in the remainder and we can just work with that. Okay, cool. So, so far so good. Um, if R equals zero, so this is what we're trying to prove. This is true. Otherwise, R is, what values can R have? R can be 1, 2, all the way up to P minus 1. Okay, so our R, remember R is the remainder after dividing by P. We've established that we can rule out the zero case. So here, R is a member of this set, which just so happens to be U of P. Okay, so now we have a group. That's cool. So we had to relate this to group theory somehow, so we're on the we maybe are on the right track. We know that the order of this group, U of P, is equal to P minus one. So by corollary four, an element to the order of the group, so R to the p minus 1 mod p must be equal to the identity which is 1. Okay and we can therefore multiply by r on both sides which gives us r to the p mod p equals r as required. All right, so we managed to turn this into a statement about um, the order of a group. We established that R was our remainder. The fact that we're working mod P kind of gave us a clue that we're quite likely to end up in either ZP or U of P. And it turns out U of P was the most helpful one. And so we just made a, uh, took, a, took advantage of corollary 4 to get what was very close to the identity we wanted. Then the final multiplication by R gave us all we needed, which is quite cool. All right, so that's enough for one video. Um, we'll see you in the next one. So we've learned about Lagrange's theorem, which says that orders of subgroups divide orders of groups. And we've shown we can get some quite interesting results um, that follow as corollaries to this and not necessarily the most obvious ways. All right, we'll catch you next time. Kakite kite